Hello, Professor Bill Tiller. How are you? I am doing very well, thank you, Lilo. Thank you for accepting. Pleasure to talk with you. Well, same here because you uh, you were actually featured in in uh, the movie What the Blip Do We Know? That's been uh, going around and around and around, and it's been absolutely enlightening. So thank you for for being part of that. And, it was my pleasure. And and you're also you also were a professor at Stanford University and and wrote many many scientific pa papers. You're very well respected in the, in the scientist world, and particularly because you 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 studied something. You studied the energy and something that you called the psychoenergetic science. Correct. Can you tell us what this science is? I was a fully orthodox scientist. For, from 1955 to 1964 in industry where I was <clears throat> an advisory physicist working in the area of materials with Westinghouse Research Laboratories mm -hmm. in Pennsylvania. And then I moved to Stanford University in 64 as a full professor in the Department of Material Science, uh, which is in the School of Engineering at Stanford. And in my orthodox science, I've uh, written or co-written three books and 275 scientific papers. So I do have a, an orthodox science calling card. Mm -hmm. I was a professor at Stanford from 64 to uh, 1998 when I became a uh, professor emeritus. And my last PhD, st PhD student finished up in 2000. Mm. But in, in 1970, I began a second branch of my science, and I did it in parallel with my orthodox science. And I, I did it avocationally because it's not the kind of science that universities of the world like to give any mm -hmm. uh, attention to. Mm -hmm. And... and uh, in that scientific area, I have now written four books and about 150 scientific papers and a dozen white papers that are on my website, www.tiller.org, and they're free for anyone to read and take away. The uh, unstated assumption of science, of orthodox science, since the days of Descartes has been that no human qualities of consciousness, intention, emotion, mind, or spirit can significantly influence a well-designed target experiment in physical reality. And that has become an unstated assumption. Uh, even though in the days of Descartes, they, he decided it was very useful to adopt this as an as assumption because it made the doing of orthodox science simpler and it left all the other stuff in the realm, we'll call it of religion, but religion can't particularly handle it either. Mm -hmm. um, and orthodox science doesn't realize it, but it has carried this assumption um, with it for the last 400 years. And because of that, orthodox science um, must neglect any consideration of human consciousness in physical reality. Um, although there's a variety of talk about consciousness in quantum mechanics and so on, it basically is a flaw, that statement. And the reason it's a flaw is that our orthodox science of today is cast in the reference frame of distance and time. Mm -hmm. And therefore, going jumping ahead to quantum mechanics, quantum mechanics and the classical mechanics before it can only deal with phenomena that in nature that are spatially and temporally dependent, whereas aspects of consciousness, uh, human intention, uh, human emotions, human mind, human spirit, they are not spatially and temporally dependent. They may be temporally dependent because of the evolution of the beings, but they're definitely not spatially dependent. And therefore, it is impossible 
for our present paradigm to deal with this whole class of phenomena, which has been around and manifesting in nature for millennia. Mm -hmm. uh, because these are, the, these are the wonderful qualities of humans. Mm -hmm. and, and orthodox science must neglect them because of the, their assumptions. And what science can do, science can look for internal self-consistency relative to a reference frame. Mm -hmm. And for the last 400, day, 400 years, pardon me, since the days of Galileo and Copernicus and Kepler and Newton, the reference frame has been distance and time. And so it's understandable that for orthodox science, anything that doesn't, cannot be internally self-consistent with that reference frame, they must neglect it. Mm -hmm. But the dilemma is they don't realize that this is what they have been doing. Hmm. It seems all perfectly reasonable to them, and therefore this stuff where consciousness can affect a space or consciousness can change the properties of materials, that has to be anathema to them, and it is. Um, and, the, and the dilemma is they are stuck in a reference frame of distance and time, and what psychoenergetic science does is it expands that reference frame mm -hmm. to include human consciousness and human intention etc. as mm, an important experimental variable mm -hmm. uh, in science in our present world and in our future world. Well, that, that change, so, yeah, that changes a lot of things, just adding that parameter. <laughs> yes, exactly. I mean, that, that's really what it comes down to. And if, if, if orthodox science would look at the data, really look at the data, they would see that there is much more for them to do. Uh -huh. it's, it's really much like the situation back in the days of Galileo when the priests of the time wouldn't look through the telescope at the experimental data in the heavens because within their psyche, they knew, in quotes, what the answer was. So they didn't need to look at the experimental data. Um, that's the way it happens when... Um, science, orthodox science are the priests of today and they're doing exactly the same thing they, f they, don't need, they feel they don't need to look at the data because it's not internally self-consistent with their paradigm mm. Mm -hmm. without, without realizing that nature is so much richer than they imagine right and so, and so, and yeah, so what, does that, what does that, what does those uh, laboratory experiments uh, reveal for us? What does it point at to us in our daily lives? Well, that we have two is, realities going on? Um, well, <laughs> there are several realities, of <laughs> course. Yeah. But, but uh, what we have experimentally discovered is that <clears throat> there are two uniquely different levels of physical reality. There is our normal electric atom molecule level of reality that uh, is, is the basis for orthodox science understanding. The second level of physical reality, it actually is the coarsest level of the physical vacuum. So, the, and the vacuum is, there's stuff that functions within the space between the electric particles that make up our atoms and molecule, molecules in our normal reality. And I call that the uncoupled state um, because the material functioning at the coarsest level of the vacuum, and I'm presuming all levels of the vacuum, they go faster than the velocity of electromagnetic light. And therefore, they cannot be accessed by our cognitive senses nor can they be accessed by our present instrumentation today because the present instrumentation of today is based on electromagnetism which has an upper limit of the velocity of light. Because the stuff of the vacuum goes faster than light, normally these two levels of physical reality don't interact with each other. However, I, our experimental data indicates that there is a coupler which comes from some higher dimensional domain of emotion of, 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 the, of the universe, and I call that 
coming from the domain of emotion. And I give it a name. I call it Deltron. You have to have a name. Mm. It's just a name. But it appears to be able to go slower and faster than the velocity of light because it functions in a domain outside of distance and time. Mm. And, and therefore, when that coupler occurs, now what you have is you have the two levels of reality beginning to interact with each other. And we have found from our experimental data that it is not the electric atom molecule level of reality that is influenced by human intention. It is this first coarsest level of the physical vacuum, which we call the magnetic information wave level. Mm. Now, when that happens, human intention, once they're coupled, once these levels are coupled, human intention can influence both the properties of materials and it can influence the space that uh, one sits in or lives in, mm. a room, a building, etc. cetera. Mm. Um, now, now, now let me go to the second piece. The second piece and I'll, is that this new reference frame that I speak of, it's a duplex reference frame, mm -hmm. which includes, it, instead of it being four-dimensional, uh, distance and time, it is, mm, we'll call it eight-dimensional for the moment, um, but it's, it's really seven. The, the issue is if the duplex space is made of two subspaces, one of which is space-time, and the other one is the reciprocal of space-time. Mm. And the interesting thing about that is that if you have a property, because of this aspect of them being reciprocals to each other, it means that this other space, it's, it's in essence, it's one over distance, which is a frequency, a spatial frequency. And it's one over time, which is a temporal frequency. Mm -hmm. But there are some unknown coefficients in it. So in essence, the other subspace is a frequency domain. It's not limited by distance and by time. Mm -hmm. And so these psychoenergetic phenomena function at that level of reality. Now, there's an important piece that needs to be added. We have shown experimentally that humans, the human acupuncture meridian system, is already at the coupled level of physical reality. So it says within all humans, we have the infrastructure to use our intention to change the properties of materials within our own body mm -hmm. and ultimately as we develop ourselves outside of our body. So we really work at this kind of thing inside then one can change oneself from a normal individual to an adept, from an adept to a master, and eventually from a master to an avatar. All humans appear to have that latent capability. And psychoenergetic science is the science that will be an extension of orthodox science, but it will allow us to manifest these capabilities as humans, but allow us to research now a whole other area of nature. That is where the human psyche comes into play and can come into a play in a very significant way. And that will lead to new technologies. It will lead to all kinds of new science and new understandings. And we will understand more about ourselves. Now, when we talk about spirit, the reference frame for physical reality is embedded in a higher dimensional reference frame mm -hmm. of which the emotion domain, the mind domain, and the an aspect of the spirit domain are part of that higher dimensional reality. And it, it, each of these domains has, has a multiplicity of, of energies and things that we could call substances, except that they're not like what we cognitively perceive with our present level of mental development as humans. Some people are clairvoyants, they can see the next level. Some are really good clairvoyants and they can see at the higher levels. This is all, for orthodox science, must be considered as garbage because it doesn't fit their internal self-consistency requirement. You see, it's really important to understand that because science 
it doesn't really seek truth. It seeks internal self-consistency relative to a particular reference frame or paradigm. Yeah. And, and that's why there is this dichotomy between the orthodox science community and the complementary alternative medicine community, etc. It, but it's part of a natural evolutionary process. Yeah. We spent four, it's, it's as if there's a, a ladder of understanding, as I write about in my books, that for nature. And, and we ultimately have to build that ladder. And we, in the last 400 years, have built the bottom rung. Okay? The orthodox science thinks that's all there is to it. Nothing else in nature, just that. Yeah. I, they're, they're terribly mistaken, and they're terribly stuck. Um, were you were you always thinking in that um, mind frame, in that, I, I, or, yeah, or did, was there a shift at some point? I always thought that the items of parapsychology were reasonable, um, even as a young man. I started out as a poet as a young man, um, huh. and my wife was a little unhappy with me when I, I turned into a scientist and said, but in essence, there was always the inner feeling of that there was so much more. And in fact, if you look at the work of the romantic poets of a century or two ago, they were describing aspects of nature in a very, very glorious way. Um, mm -hmm. But they were trying to get at the same kind of thing. I mean, we're talking about people like Byron and, and Keats and Shelley and, and a variety of people, and forgive me for not putting in the French ones, but there were lots of wonderful uh, French poets. But they, they didn't have a frame of reference that could be quantitative. Mm -hmm. They described the feelings within in glorious terms. And they described dimensionalities that were far beyond our normal cognitive reality. Well, now psychoenergetic science is trying to build this... Mm, this, this this next rung of the ladder, and it's only this the next bridge rung too. Of the it seems yes, yes, and only it's only the next rung of the ladder, mm -hmm. and there are many other rungs that we will meet on our evolutionary path. Is but is is the new energy coming on the planet going to help that?